Vince is going to say a few things, and then you know, I may ask him a few things, and then you can ask him a few things. And uh, Cancel has no problem. There's no not much of a filter between his brain and his mouth. So <laughs> it's going to be good. So James Elmore, the great. I put a spell on you. <laughs> but mine. Good evening, peepers, prowlers, pederasts, pedants, panty sniffers, punks, and pimps. I'm Jim Zelroy, the death dog with the hog, the foul owl with the death growl, and the slick trick with the donkey dick. I'm the author of 23 books, masterpieces all, they precede all my future masterpieces. These books will leave you reamed, steamed, and dry cleaned, tied, dyed, and swept to the side, screwed, glued, tattooed, and ba fung good. If each and every one of you buy 1,000 copies of my new novel, The Enchanters, tonight, You'll be able to have unlimited sex with each and every person on this earth that you desire every night for the rest of your lives. If each and every one of you buy 2,000 copies of my new book, The Enchanters Tonight, you get all that sex and you get into heaven as a result of a special dispensation signed by me, the Reverend Elder. <laughs> if each and every one of you buy 3,000 copies of this book tonight, you get the sec to get into heaven. And for the first time in its grimy, unkempt history, Lower Manhattan will rule the world. <laughs> you heard it here first, off the record, on the QT, and very hush, hush. T.S. Eliot wrote, if you came this way, starting from anywhere, at any time and in any season, it would always be the same. You would have to put off sense and notion you are not here to instruct yourself or to inform curiosity or to carry report. You are here to kneel where prayer has been proven valid. And for me, Elroy, the demon dog of American literature, what better place to bow my head in prayer than a bookshop wherein we all venerate the printed word on paper. This is my best novel, The Enchanters. It is an enunciatory moment, and tonight marks an anointment. Ninety-six years ago, Dashiell Hammett's first novel, Red Harvest was published. Now, 2023, many, many moons after 1929, comes its corollary. Hammett and I represent the alpha and the omega of the American hard-boiled novel. The great jurist critic David T. Bazin said this of Hammett. The core of Hammett's art is the masculine figure in American society. He is primarily a job holder. He goes at his job with a bloodthirsty determination which proceeds from an unwillingness to go beyond it. This relationship to the job is perhaps typically American. The idea of doing or not doing a job competently has replaced the full, larger issue 
of good and evil. Dashiell Hammett, James Elroy, the two masters of American hard-boiled fiction. This book, The Enchanters, is derived from many sources, some of them literary and some of them design. They are sources that are physical. They are the physical novels of the American 1960s of the popular populist breed of great underappreciated authors like Harold Robbins and Irving Wallace and Jacqueline Suzanne. How many of you look down your snouts at the carpetbaggers, the adventurers, the plot, the love machine, the valley of the dolls and the inheritors? I got these books at a liquor store called Crown Liquor in Lower Hollywood where I grew up. One paperback rack away was the semi-smut books, Unknown Authors, The Call Girls, The Housewives, The Stewardesses, the gynecologists <laughs> and the world drapers. After I finished my novel, Widespread Panic, three novellas really, a satirical Fred Okash book, I decided to go back and write a hard charging, shit kicking, Bite your ass, maul your ass, kill your ass, eat your ass, <laughs> and devour your ass, and shit it out under a high book, book that should have been written by a royal Bengal tiger. <laughs> and since Hammett and I are, well, frail human men, and since <clears throat> tigers don't know how to write, I had to do it myself. My books are historical. This book is no exception. I play hell with history. My idea of history is to find an exploitable latitude of non-history so that I might rewrite history to my own specifications. And when I came across the story of the summer of 1962 and the OD death of overrated hack actress Marilyn Monroe, who actually knew Freddie O'Dash, may have played Barry the Brisket with John and Robert Kennedy. It was too much for me to resist. I have one question that I never answer. What's real and what's not in my books? And I also have three topics that I never stray to with people in book audiences. I do not discuss politics. I do not discuss my personal life, and I do not discuss the shitty movies made for my books, <laughs> <laughs> pictures that I may have written for money. Other than that, after Otto and I conclude our dialogue, there's nothing I would like more within those confines to answer the most invasively over personal questions <laughs> that each and every one of you peepers, prowlers, pederasts, peds, panty sniffers, punks, and pimps has for me. <laughs> Let us sit next to Adam. Yeah. <laughs> I'll
span. Put span. Yeah. We can stand it. So, um, first thing I want to ask is, uh, what's your opinion about the movie Black? Uh, never. Mind. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, but I know you never talk about which parts of your books are fiction, which are real. But there was a real Freddie Otash. Was there was a real Freddie Otash. Yes. Noted L.A. sack of shit. <laughs> I knew him in his waning years. He was a shakedown artist. He verified stories for a confidential magazine. At one point, he had most of the notable gay bathhouses in L.A. hotwired in case he could get celebrated lads in there doing the er, er, er. He had Beverly Hills Hotel Suites hot wired because Gary Cooper used to take high school cheerleaders there to do the er, 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 er. That's my hero. <laughs> Gary Cooper? He is now. He is now. <laughs> he had the goods on everybody. He had every car park attendant, he had every head waiter, he had everybody in Hollywood on his dole. <clears throat> and the reason that Confidential Magazine that he worked for after he left the LAPD survived as long as it did was because everything that Freddie wrote was true. <laughs> yeah, of course it was. <laughs> <laughs> And that's the only viable defense against slander and libel. Yeah, that's true. Um, so he, but he was a cop in his early years. Right. And uh, now in uh, The Enchanters, he's a private eye. Yeah. Didn't you once say the private eye novel is dead? Until I resurrected <laughs> it. <laughs> Yeah, Otash has been in several of your books, right. and he's a compelling character, even if he's not the most upstanding citizen. Yeah. But that's the fact that he is such a lowlife is what attracted you to writing about him. Because most of the people you write about are not exactly upstanding citizens. They are, as we all are, divided souls. The world is a tortured, fallen, place, and Freddy is a sinner in his secret heart of hearts looking to a top. And uh, here he is, a major role here. Um, one of the things that is particularly interesting about this, uh, you are one of many, many talented writers who have somehow incorporated Marilyn Monroe into their books. Yeah. Uh, while she's not really a character in the book. She is central to the book. Yes. And explain that. I disliked her intensely. I, I disliked her as a human being, as an actress. Her third husband, Arthur Miller, called her a monster. I agree with that. I have no use for her. She never did a thing for me as a woman. And she was there, and I had an idea. And you're right. She's a plot central, but she doesn't appear. Right. Uh, there are intimations in, in your book, uh, and we know that you write fiction, mm -hmm. uh, that she was involved in some ways with uh, both John and Robert Kennedy. Not Robert. Never, Robert Kennedy never poured the pork to Marilyn Monroe. <laughs> I got that straight from Freddie Otash. <clears throat> well, it, uh, it is well rumored, as, yeah. as, as you well know. Yeah. But uh, does John, do the Kennedy brothers make an appearance in this book? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah I, I know they still read yeah. the book. Yeah, you're right. <laughs> <laughs> in what way? Do they appear in your book? What what role do they play? They're, they're nervous because she's telling tales about them, and she's pesky, and they want her to shut up. <laughs> so, would you regard would you regard this book 
as more of a crime novel, a detective novel, or a novel about the era, and just using the the crime fiction elements as a uh, as an engine to move through all all of the politics. It's a Hollywood novel. It's a populist novel. It is a modernist novel. Most of all, it's a shit kick on detective novel on quite a while. This is the first detective novel you've written in quite a while. Yes. And uh, you can't answer the monosyllabic. Like <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah, I can't. I, I, I can't as well. Two minutes. I can do that. Yeah. No, no. So what, are, what brought you back to writing about detective? Detective I picture. started thinking of the books I read. I am not expert on the Kennedy assassination, but at ABA, American Booksellers Association, the one they had in Anaheim in 1988, I picked up a, an advanced reading copy of Don DeLillo's novel, Libra, and I got interested in the Kennedy assassination. And at first, I thought, shit, I can never write a book about the assassination because the Lolo got there first. But I saw that I could write a book about the five years preceding Kennedy's death and write a book where in Oswald does not even appear on the page, which is what I did. This is, this is, I don't think this is the first time you used Kennedy in one of your books. Bad Back Jack, Mattress Jack, well known to be hung like a cashew, it's the well known Irish curse, has appeared in numerous of my big political books. Most notably, American Tabloid, Time Magazine's Novel of the Year 1995, which will soon appear as a, are you ready for this? 21 and a half hour podcast. Next month. I read the narration, noted actors, read the novel. Unabridged, unexpurgated, lots of great sound effects. 21 and a half hours with earbuds. <laughs> if you get through it, I'd be real surprised. It sounds to me like a gimmick. <laughs> At 21 and a half hours. You'd have to be a kid to stay awake that long. Yeah. So uh, do you see, now that you've come back to your roots, really, where you started as a, as a crime writer, uh, using both cops and private eyes mm -hmm. in, in your books, do, does this... In, inspire you to go back to writing more crime novels and less political works. Although I know you don't totally separate the two. That's true, I don't, but I was midway through the second LA Quartet, which took characters from the original LA Quartet and the Underworld USA trilogy and put them in LA during World War II as significantly younger people. I got bored with L.A. during World War II. I wrote <laughs> The Enchanters. I decided to write the L.A. Quintet. That's five books. Hence, Perfidia and This Storm, the first two books of the former second L.A. Quartet, will be followed by The Enchanters and two more Freddie Otash books, all of which occur in the waning months of 1962. Not a, uh, a broad spectrum of years, but an intense yes. look at a time. Yes, it's a micro history of LA in 62 when I was 14. <clears throat> when you when you started, no, let me rephrase that. When I first knew you, yeah. and we worked together very early in your career, early in my career too, for that matter. You used to think about your book. You would, uh, you would stretch out on your couch, mm -hmm. listen to Beethoven, mm -hmm. and think about your book. And when you were 
ready, you knew how to write the book. Well, I would write the outline. Yes, yeah. but you yeah. knew where you were going. You yeah. thought about it mm -hmm. for weeks on end. Yeah, maybe even longer. Yeah, so is that still, still the way you? It's still the way you do it. Yeah, crap out on a bed, crap out on a couch, and think for a period of weeks or months. The outline for the Enchanters, four hundred and twenty-five pages. And then I write the book. It seems to work for you. It has. <laughs> Do, do you know, by the, by the time you actually put pen to paper, and I know you still put pen to paper, right? Um, do you, you know the whole thing? You know where you're going, and you know what happens at the end? Yes. You know the journey? Yes. You know all of it? Down to the most minute detail. Oh, that's great. And I outlined this book, because it's a first-person book, I outlined it down to Freddie O'Chash's every thought because the reader needs to know why Freddie does the things that he does. And he's always thinking. So you put everybody inside his head. Yeah, they're in Freddy. there, they're bopping around, and Freddie's also an alcoholic and a drug addict. And he, he's a good thinker if a flawed thinker. So the, your next book, will be a Freddie Otash book, mm -hmm. set in the exact same period of time. Later in the year 1962. 62, yeah. So Kennedy will probably make another appearance. No, no Kennedys in this book, but, but the astonishingly empathetic Richard Nixon. <laughs> 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 uh, <laughs> just, just as an aside, uh, I don't want to take away, take away any of your time, but I just have to say that I was very close friends for a long time with a, with a White House speechwriter for every Republican from Dwight D. Eisenhower through Ronald Reagan. And the staff of the House, of the White House, always said the one person who is the kindest and most thoughtful and nicest person of all of those people was Richard Nixon. <laughs> Contrary to his reputation, which has been fostered by a left-wing press, but I won't get into that. <laughs> we won't talk about politics here at all. Uh, but but uh, Nixon very seldom shows up in a book as a uh, as in a positive light, and uh, I don't want you to tip off too much of what right. you want. You want me to tell you who the bad guys are in this book? Sure, it's a real subtle. It's the fucking commies. <laughs> <laughs> that was a simple book. Yeah. It wasn't hard to figure out. They still are. <laughs> Okay, I, I have nothing more. I, I want to ask you a dopey question. This is the kind of question that, that you never, nobody ever wants, no author ever wants to hear. Apart from your new book, which of you, the books that you have written in the past are you most proud of? Perfidia. Good book. Okay, that's it. Now, who has questions? Yeah. Of all your characters, Who's your favorite, and why is it Pete Bondurant? <laughs> <laughs> Who is your favorite character of all the ones that you've created, and why is it Pete Bondurant? It's not Pete Bondurant. <laughs> it's, not, it's, it's not Pete Bondurant. William H. Parker, the real-life William H. Parker, legendary chief of the LAPD, who appears throughout my work, and most notably in Perfidia in the Star. And the greatest character I've ever created is a woman, and it's Kay Light. Yes, go ahead. So you backed Larry Hamish. You did a forward for... Um, Larry Harnish, you mean? Harnish, sorry. Harnish had a theory about the Black Dagger <laughs> murder case, and I stupidly co-signed Steve Hodell's Black Dahlia Venture 
they're not the killers. He's crazy. <laughs> <laughs> so I that's my question. Who do, you, who do you think? I don't know. I don't care. I wrote that. <laughs> <laughs> Damn near 40 years ago. Right? <laughs> it's stale bread. <laughs> yes. I think it's okay. <laughs> well, yeah, it's, it's, sure. <laughs> that question, by the way, was can I take your picture? <laughs> in case you couldn't hear that in the back. Enhancing the really moment. Yes, I know. I asked this a long time ago, so I'm going to ask it again, but there's maybe a change. Is Sterling Hayden or Robert Ryan? Robert Ryan, Sterling Hayden. Edmund O'Brien, our noir archetypes. Keep in mind that noir is commonly misused. People mean to describe the hard-boiled canon. I don't write noir, never have. Books that are written now that are policiers, <clears throat> private eye books, books right with Violent masculine intrigue, not noir. That's that's hard blow. But the three big actors are the sweaty, desperate, pudgy, in over his head, Edmund O'Brien, the poetic brute, Sterling Hayden, and the self pitying psychopath. Robert Ryan, who is a hate dog. He's always a hate dog. In Bed at Black Rock, he hates the Japanese. In Crossfire, he hates the Jews. He's got to have somebody to hate. Who's the most limited? Ryan going away. Who's the most impressive? Ryan. <laughs> Who's the cool. least impressive? Sterling Hayden. He's got a lousy voice. He's just a, a great big oversized guy. And in Crime Wave, they even build the squadron set low to offset his height. If memory serves, you said Sterling Hayden the last time. <laughs> I changed my mind. <laughs> I did. With the late Curtis Hansen and I, we went to see Crime Wave at a revival house, and I pointed out to him, uh, Curtis Hansen directed L.A. Confidential, and I pointed to Sterling Hayden and said, Buck Russell Crowe, he's impotent. That's a bug one. I would put Robert Mitchum in that group, by the way. That's, yeah, yeah, uh, Mitchum is a great good. noir. Kind of Sleepy eyed, because he was a hot guy. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> <laughs> James and I, some years ago, uh, did an anthology called Best, Best American Noir of the Century, uh, where we write about what noir fiction is. And it's, and People called, talked about the Maltese Falcon and things like that. The, the, the private eye novel is 180 degrees opposite of noir. Noir is about people who are doomed because of their own flaws. No matter what happens, their, their, their basic lack of decency dooms them from the beginning. Uh, and their quest for women or money or power is doomed because they are are their self-inflicted uh, wounds that they're born with that, and have developed over the years. Whereas the private eye novels are the direct opposite because the, the, uh, the private eye is, is a heroic figure, yeah. a knight. So, yeah. yeah, and has agency. He is possessed exactly. of agency. But there is one great and hilarious major theme to noir, and that is you're fucked. <laughs> in, in a way, I, I would say that your three Lloyd Hopkins novels are noir, because even though Lloyd Hopkins is a, is a policeman and is going after a really bad guy, his own lack of decency dooms him as well. <coughs> do, you, do you agree with that? Yeah. Yeah. <coughs> okay. 
There's somebody who's hand. Oh, yeah. There. yeah, there he is. <laughs> Since we're on the uh, subject subject of noir and uh, movies, any thoughts on Barbara Stanwyck? She'd be perfect to film noir. Never did a film out. for me. Never did a Yeah. Lois Nettleton, oh. the, the very accomplished Broadway and TV actress, appears in The right. Enchanters and Widespread Panic. Shirley was in that. Shirley Knight was another one of them. I, I by and large, went for the second line actresses. Yeah, you had a question. Yeah, I, I just reread Bought the Road like the mm -hmm. third time. And there's a section in there where you have Nixon and J. Edgar Hoover having a conversation. And I read that out loud, and I couldn't stop laughing after I, I read that out loud. And then I noticed, like, from that Blood the Road before, we seem to have brought in more of a broad humor, like Freddy going to purgatory. Uh, my question was, is that a conscious decision on your it, part to, to bring in that? Don't, okay. Uh, Blood the Rover is the concluding volume of the Underworld USA trilogy. These three novels span 1958 to 1970. They're not set in LA, they're not policiers in any way. They're big political books. Think of the tumult of the time and the key confrontations and you'll, you'll have the trilogy. Widespread panic is comedy. That's Freddy in Purgatory. It's a deliberately broad book and I stick it to cultural figures that I despise. The actor James Dean, the director Nicholas Ray, and the movie The Rebel Without a Cause. And the youth culture. I've always hated the youth culture. <laughs> Even when I was a youth. <laughs> yeah. Why keep pushing what? Freddy to the limits of his morality and we think the real Freddy is in heaven or hell? Well, I'm a Christian, and this is a Christian novel, and it's my most Christian novel. And you'll note the epigraph is from Psalms, 31st Psalm. You'll note that whenever Freddy hears or sees something he absolutely can't stand, can't live with, he crosses himself, there is a great deal of Freddy praying in this book. So take it from there. Okay. I'm not done with Freddie yet. <laughs> I was not a fan of the Reverend Jesse Jackson, but he had a good line. Be patient with me. God isn't through with me yet. Sir. Yeah. Um, I was wondering uh, as lonesome as it may be to think of, is there any director uh, of movies, uh, past or present, who you think could take on your books for an adaptation, whether it was movie or television? And is Blood is uh, Blood's Rover, is that still being developed? Because I thought that was being developed at some point, or some sort of movie or something. I have an option on, on it, and now that the writer's strike is over, they're going to pull the force <clears throat> majeure clause and pay me my guilt. Now, I'm not much I'm not much of an entourist. And I don't think about movie directors a lot. If I had to pick one, my favorite of all time, I do the only director I can think of who ever directed two great movies was Michelangelo and Tony Elmi with La Ventura. But they don't do private eyes. <laughs> <laughs> they do Boyer. And Tony Oni does Boyer. It is so great. You want to have a great... It's your thing. thing. It's my thing. It's my thing. <laughs> you want to have a great Boyeristic experience like I did when I was 18 years old? I saw with my buddy, rest in peace, Randy Rice. He died in 18. He and I were at loose ends on a Friday night, and we 
took the bus out to Westwood Village and we went to the Crest Theater and we saw a movie called Blow Up. And it was a 1966 movie, Randy and I were both 18. And we were bored up to a point, right up to the point when the hero, this raggedy ass little Brit guy, David Hemmings, <clears throat> goes into the park with his camera, hunting for ideas. And there is the imperiously tall, stunning, Vanessa Redgrave, I had never seen her before, and there she is, caught in freeze frames, maybe murdering her lover, maybe not. Big moment for me. <laughs> Big moment. Okay, we have time for one more, and then we're going to get some books signed, okay? You had your hands up earlier. Go ahead. Thanks. Um, just a question as far as uh, as far as your process goes in, in constructing the enchanters, um, is the draw for you uh, diving into the history and deconstructing some of the myths, or is it in taking Freddie and you know seeing where he goes and kind of taking us on that that uh, crazy ride? It's the latter of those two. First of all, I got to put it together. I've got to look for negative research. I want the latitude to fictionalize. I found plenty of it here in the Monroe story. Then I start laser beaming in on it and go from there. Does anybody want to ask me the portentous question? Why do you write? You can all yell it out or shout it out. That's fine. Why do you write? One more time. Why do you write? A last time. Why do you write? In my craft or sullen art, exercise in the still night, when only the moon rages and the lovers lie abed with all their griefs in their arms, I labor by singing light, not for the strut and trade of charms upon the ivory stages, but for the common wages of their most secret heart. Not for the proud man of heart do I write on these spindrift pages, but for the lovers, their arms round the griefs of the ages, who pay no praise or wages nor heed my craft or art. Dylan Thomas, thank you, God bless you.